Coming up on today's show, Tesla pushes back its international launch date for the Model 3 electric sedan to next year. Jaguar says it's working on an SVR variant of the I-Pace that could technically beat the upcoming second-generation Tesla Roadster. And Hyundai is rumored to be working on building its own lithium-ion cells, presumably to help it combat the chronic battery shortage it's currently experiencing. These stories and more coming next. Hello to wherever you are in the world and whenever you're watching this. It's time for another weekly news roundup here on TEN, and as usual, there's a lot to cover. But before I do, a little apology from last week. I screwed up on the Model 3 production volume and did some bad, bad maths. Yes, 7 times 500 is 3,500, not 5,000. I really have no excuse. Really, I don't save for the fact that I didn't bother to check my script for typos before recording and I read what's on the script. Mea culpa. Oh, and like last week, I'm recording today's show early, as I'll be on an airplane bound for the UK on Friday, so if I've missed a late-breaking story, I'll do my best to cover it ASAP. We're starting today's show with an update to the Tesla Model 3 braking distance story from last week. As I'm sure you'll remember, Consumer Reports had said that it couldn't recommend people buy the Tesla Model 3 because in its own independent testing, it observed average stopping distances for Model 3 that were far longer than the stopping distance of a Ford F-150 pickup truck. At the same time, Tesla and Elon Musk promised to look into it and quickly trace the problem to a faulty calibration subroutine in the braking system. A few tweaks later, and Tesla pushed updated software to customers' cars by the over-the-air update system. And now, Consumer Reports, after retesting the braking distances, says it's more than happy to recommend customers buy a Model 3. All's well that ends well, eh? Sticking with Tesla, the company confirmed this week that those waiting for a Tesla Model 3 outside of the US may have a little longer to wait than had originally been hoped, pushing back the start of international deliveries of Model 3 to somewhere between early to mid-2019. It's hardly a surprise for those who've been keeping track of Tesla's production volumes, but it is sad news to anyone who's already been waiting for more than two years to get their hands on a Model 3. And if you live in a right-hand drive country, it's worth noting that date is for exports to start to left-hand drive countries. And given that Tesla has already said right-hand drive deliveries will lag left-hand deliveries significantly, you're in for an even longer wait if you're in a country which drives on the left. Sorry. As it gears up to launch its first mass-produced electric car in the form of the Audi e-tron Quattro SUV, Audi has dropped some extra details in our lap this week about how the mid-sized crossover has managed to achieve a drag coefficient of 0.28, a figure normally reserved for much smaller hatchbacks and sedans. According to Audi, it's used everything from dimpling, like what you see on golf balls, on the underside body panels of the e-tron Quattro to active air suspension that can lower the suspension and reduce drag at high speed. It also plans on using rear-view cameras rather than mirrors in countries where such an arrangement is legal and, says Audi, helps the e-tron Quattro achieve a range of 400 kilometers 248 miles on the new WLTP test cycle. It's not clear which markets will ultimately allow those rear view cameras, but of course, when specs are released for each market, I'll let you know. It may only be in the early days of launching its iPACE electric crossover SUV, but Jaguar Land Rover looks as if it might be already at work developing a special performance variant of the long range car that will wear the SVR performance badge. While Jaguar told Autocar this week it could technically produce an SVR variant with a 0 to 60 miles per hour time of 1.8 seconds or quicker, which would be faster than the Tesla Roadster second generation, it seems the iPACE is likely not to go that route, with Jaguar reasoning that the instant torque and performance might be a little too much for the average car driver. Instead, it says it will be focusing on handling performance and road manners, and I presume perhaps a tweak or two to power output. Although Jaguar stopped short of confirming the car would make it out of the workshop and onto the production line, there is hope. Given Jaguar is already producing a race-ready iPACE for use in a race series, I'm sure we're gonna see an iPACE SVR sometime soon. That's if demand is high enough. As more and more companies around the world produce lithium-ion battery packs, both for gadgets and electric vehicles, there's more pressure on them to ensure that the cobalt they use in their battery packs, an essential component in most lithium-ion battery chemistries, is sourced responsibly and not connected to child labor in the Democratic Republic of the Congo. 
As a large producer of lithium-ion cells, Tesla has already researched and developed new cell chemistries that use far less cobalt than the competition, think a few kilograms per car, but it released its conflict minerals report this week to disclose just what it's doing to ensure the cobalt it's using right now comes from ethical sources. At the moment, Tesla says it's not uncovered any human rights abuse in its supply chains, and while its supplier chain is growing, as the number of batteries it needs to make is on the increase, Tesla says it's confident that none of the materials it uses in its vehicles come from places which violate basic human rights. As well as working on bringing a whole slew of new electric cars to market, Mercedes-Benz is readying a series of electric commercial vehicles, one of which will be an all-electric variant of its popular Sprinter van. This week, we heard details of the specifications of that vehicle for the first time, with Benz promising a choice of 41 kilowatt hour or 55 kilowatt hour battery pack, with the larger pack offering a range of around 150 kilometers, that's 93 miles, when loaded up with 900 kilograms, 1,984 pounds of payload. Like other short-range small delivery vans, this vehicle is not meant for long-distance travel and is instead built to operate on short inner-city routes, where recharging from empty to 80% full during a 45-minute lunch break is far more important than being able to drive non-stop for eight hours. With an official EPA-approved range of 238 miles per charge, the Chevrolet Bolt EV is already capable of traveling large distances with ease. For example, I recently covered more than 600 miles in a day in mine, and that was using the so-called slow DC quick charging stations rated at just 20 kilowatts. But a reader contacted me this week with details of six prototype Bolt EVs they spotted in Pittsburgh, complete with manufacturer plates, whose drivers claimed that they had been driving all morning without charging and still had more than 230 miles of range remaining. I reached out to GM for confirmation that perhaps it might be working on a longer range battery pack for the Bolt EV and, surprise, surprise, GM was unable to comment on this tip-off. Based on GM's response, though, I'd say that there is a longer-range Bolt EV in the works. It's just not clear how long we'll have to wait to see it into production. For some time now, the UK has offered customers buying electric cars and businesses buying electric vans generous grants that have helped lower the cost of plug-in car purchase, with most long-range electric cars attracting an instant £4,500 purchase grant and most electric vans attracting an £8,000 electric grant. Called the Plug-in Car Grant Scheme, the scheme was due to end in April, but the UK government has confirmed that it's extended the scheme until October this year, giving those EV fans in the UK a few more more months to take advantage of the full grant before it starts to tail off completely. Meanwhile, the UK government is reportedly also considering new grants for electric bicycles and other low emission transportation solutions for the first time, something which I wholeheartedly support as not everyone can afford or accommodate a large electric car. With the Chinese car market expanding at an incredible rate, there's a huge number of new electric automakers seeking to gain market dominance. But for the most part, these companies are currently focusing on China. But Tencent-backed startup NIO, which already produces full-size electric cars in China, has just filed for an initial public offering in the US. This filing, which sources close to the company said could raise more than two billion US dollars, would give NIO a big cash injection and help it ready its full-size plug-in cars for the Western market. Investor orders are expected to begin sometime later this summer or early autumn, but things could change between now and then, so I'll keep you updated on the latest news as it happens. While it's generally accepted that the Tesla Model S, Model X and Model 3 are some of the safest cars on the road today thanks to both active and passive safety systems, Teslas are also some of the most expensive cars to insure thanks to the unusually high number of claims made by owners versus the general population. This has put up insurance premiums for the luxury cars and a while back it led Tesla to start work on its own insurance program for Tesla owners. Called Insure My Tesla, the product was originally trialed in Australia and Hong Kong, and it's now in the US as well. Offering custom insurance plans for Tesla owners, the scheme is underwritten by a range of insurers happy to partner with Tesla and, according to Tesla, Insure My Tesla is already the favoured insurance product chosen by new Tesla customers in Australia and Hong Kong. If you've recently got a quote for it, why not share it below and let us know how it compares to standard car insurance policies. Last year, there were more than 3.7 million electric cars on the world's roads, and that figure is going to triple in the next two years. 
And that's according to the International Energy Agency, which released a new report midweek that predicts we'll see electric vehicle sales increase by an average of 24% each year over the next 12 years. This will displace somewhere in the region of 2.57 million barrels of oil per day by 2030, which is about as much oil as Germany uses at the moment each day. While that's still a drop in the ocean on a global scale, it's great news for those of us who want to see cleaner, greener, safer and smarter transportation take dominance moving forwards. With battery shortages playing havoc with its rollout plans for the Ionic EV, Hyundai is rumored to be looking into building its own battery production facilities. At least that's according to The Investor, which says that the South Korean company has been hiring battery researchers over the past few months and is planning to open up its own research lab in Yuwang later this year. At the moment, Hyundai, like Kia, relies on LG Chem and SK Innovation for its cells, but with Demand high from other automakers who are already placing far larger orders for batteries and so get dominance, it seems to make sense that the two sister companies are looking for an alternative battery source. At the moment, a company spokesperson has admitted it is looking to produce its own batteries, but declined to comment as to if they would find a home in future Hyundai or Kia vehicles. On the other side of the world, Tesla is also working hard to increase its supply of lithium-ion batteries and as such has just flown six planes full of battery production line equipment from its German engineering arm Grommen to the Reno Gigafactory. Usually, heavy machinery like this is shipped by sea as shipping by air is incredibly costly and a little more risky too. But with Tesla under the gun to produce as many Model 3s as possible and make up that production backlog, saving time is more important right now to Tesla than saving money. And finally, what do you do if you're an automaker looking to celebrate selling 100,000 examples of a particular car, either globally or in a specific market? Well, if you're Nissan and that car is the Nissan Leaf, apparently the answer is to have a quasi-convertible LEAF built. Behold the Nissan LEAF open car, a 2018 Nissan LEAF with the roof cut off between the windscreen and the C-pillar. It's not a traditional convertible per se, and is just a show car that Nissan had built to celebrate selling its 100,000th LEAF in the Japanese market. Given the size of the Japanese car market, that is quite an achievement. But as for the topless LEAF, meh. I'd rather see another LEAF pickup, to be honest. Bring it on. And on that note, it's the end of this week's show. As always, don't forget to like, comment, hit that notification bell to make sure you don't miss a single episode, and subscribe to both this channel and Transport Evolved Take Two if you've not already done so. And if you want to support the independence of this channel, why not support us with a donation by using one of the two links below or by buying some Transport Evolved swag from our shop? You don't have to, but it'd be appreciated. Before I go, I'd like to also thank you all for responding to the question from last week's show about making a Tesla-only vehicle show. And for now, the consensus is that we should keep all of the stories in one show, which means less work for me. Oh, and next week I'll be in the UK for Fully Charged Live, so there won't be the usual Friday show. So until then, thanks for joining me. I'll see you in two weeks. And as always, keep evolving.